and a very warm welcome back to the Logo Builder. Uh, I'm very sorry that it's been a while since I last released a video. I've been back in the UK, I've been busy with work, so it's been a nightmare, but we're finally back at the workbench, which is fantastic. And also a very warm welcome to all our new subscribers as well. Even though we haven't released a video recently, uh, actually we've gone, I think we're over 100 subscribers now, which is fantastic. Also the Instagram is growing as well, so that's great. And we've also had a nice little tie up with Chris Gibbons over at High Level Kits, and he's put one of my videos on his website, so hopefully that's bringing in a few more viewers as well. So it's really good that we are growing slowly and we'll try and get to maybe 200 subs by Christmas. Another little note on that, if you do watch one of my videos and you do happen to like it, please do press the like button. I know it's one of those annoying things that people ask you to do, but just do that because what it does is it helps push the video up the search rankings on YouTube and more people can find these videos more easily. So also, you know, get involved in the comments as well. That's a really good thing to do, it really helps this channel to grow. And also if you haven't already subbed, then please do press the subscribe button and hopefully you'll be updated then with any new videos that I release. So today we're looking at the DJH LNER A1 Pacific, which is this little guy here. I have done a review on it. I'll put the link to the video somewhere here probably on the screen so you can click on that. Have a look at that. Basically we look at all of the bits and bobs inside the box. We look at the extra bits and pieces that we need to complete it. So we look at the motor, the wheels, the gearbox, a couple of little extra bits and bobs there. And so once you've had a look at that, then come back to this video and we'll start part one of the kit build for this model. Okay, we're now at the workbench, so now let's have a little look inside the box and where we're actually going to start on this model. So let's just get rid of that down there. And these are my extra bits and pieces that I spoke about earlier. They're in the review, so there's a flywheel, there's extra detailing parts there, so really nice to get those involved if you can. All these lovely bits and pieces, these castings and everything, and we don't need these quite yet, so what we need to do is just pop these away in a safe place, pop them down there, whoops, like that. Sorry, a bit close to the camera. Uh, we've got wheels in there. We will need the wheels because we're going to start off with the chassis or the frames, as you might want to call them. And, well, here they are. And I'll show you those if I can, nice and close to the camera. There we go. And they're quite thickly etched in brass. And this is the traditional place to start off with these get the chassis up and running, get everything nice and sweet and true, and then you're on to a really good winner, hopefully, with your kit, because if the thing doesn't work properly, then there's not much point in building the locomotive in the first place. So we'll switch to the close-up, and we'll start with removing the bits of brass from the frame, from the fret itself, and then we'll look at cleaning up and getting everything started with this model. Here we are then with the frames. We need to remove this material here, so we need to remove these main bits from the frame, and we've also got these spacers on here. You can see there's various ones here that we're going to be using for this particular chassis. And if I could just show you, here are the instructions. Now they do look quite complicated, but actually if you go through it logically and just mark off the bits that you don't need, it's not too bad. I've actually got rid of the bits here which are for making an EM or P4 gauge chassis. So that's a slightly wider chassis than the one we're gonna be doing. We're working double O. The wider stuff is included in the kit. Oh, bloody phone goes off just as I'm filming. Never mind, we'll stick with it. Probably the wife. And so we can just get rid of those bits that we don't need. So you can make this kit P4, double O, or EM, whatever you want, and it's nice that it's included. And these are the spaces here for that, for the EM and the double, uh, for the P4. Anyway, what we're gonna do is remove these parts and. There's two ways you can do it. You can either use some of these, which are photo etch sort of shears or cutters, if you like. These are by Zeron. They're really, really good. They're very, very sharp indeed. So let's have a go with this one first of all. And here we are. So as you can see, we just snip very easily through the metal. Uh, very, very good tool, this actually. Like so. And some things you can just bend off like that, which is a bit gash, but you know, you get the idea. That's fine. So that's using the shears. The other thing that you can use is a really nice sharp scalpel blade like so. 
I'm going to use that on one of these. So I've selected the right bit that we need, which is this little chap here. It's got an F on it. They're all labeled up. It's quite easy, actually. The instructions are quite good on this kit, it seems. And uh, just using the sharp scalpel blade, just up against the piece of etch and just rocking backwards and forwards. You can feel it go through. I just felt that press through there. And then again, same here. There we are. And that's off like that. Now we need to clean them up and we'll get the files out for that. Phone again. Always the phone. Put it on mute next time. Okay, here we are working on the frames in. I've just zoomed in quite a bit just to show you what we're actually trying to achieve on this. So this is one that I haven't quite finished yet. Here you can see where I've actually filed along the top there. That's all nice and crisp and sharp and it looks square. And that's what we're trying to do with this. And here's a bit that I haven't yet done and you can see there, I hope you can see anyway, that there's a cusp where the etchant has sort of etched into the brass but hasn't quite gone all the way through, so it means that it's kind of rounded, doesn't feel so nice. What we've got to do is try and square everything off like I have done already, and the best way to do that is with lots of different sizes of file. So just stepping back ever so slightly, just one little bit before we go on. I forgot to mention earlier that when you're removing the brass from the fret, it's important to cut against a really hard surface, and that's why I use this old piece of wood, just to protect the, the etch, the brass from bending. If you cut on a, on a soft surface like this cutting mat, well it seems quite hard, you're actually liable to bend the brass and that's not what you want to do. So when you're cutting brass with a knife, just use a hard block of old wood or some perspex or something like that, something nice and hard to cut on to ensure everything stays flat. So that's that done. Right, files. So we just as you can see there, there's the nice top edge that we've already achieved there by filing. And what we're gonna do is just continue working on that just to show you the process that I use. I've got a variety of different files. I've got small ones, big ones. Um, does this make me a filer file if one has lots of files? I don't know. File facts perhaps, who knows? I don't know. Anyway, the fact is you need quite a few different sorts of metal files. If you're being pedantic, you should probably keep one file for white metal and one file for brass. I'm far too lazy and unorganized to do that, so I just use all my files and they're absolutely fine for brass and white metal. Brass is quite a soft metal, so it's quite easy to work with. So we just get our file like so, and we're just working in here, just like so, and just trying to square off the edge of the metal. And you can start to sit down, it doesn't take too long. And we're just preparing this metal, just squaring everything up like that. There you go, that's just coming along now, working in there. And then I use, for the corners, I've got one of these, a little square file like so. So we'll just work in just like that, you can see, nicely like that. And then just to show you a little bit closer up what we're doing here. Oh, wife again, just annoying me. Just working in here with the file like so. You can just see, so this is why it's handy to have a few different sizes of files that you can just work in that. Just like that, just getting that nicely into the corner there like so. And you just really want to work all the way around the edge of this like so. Uh, these little bits here as well need doing. And it's just a little bit time consuming. It probably takes, to be honest with you, about half an hour per frame just to get it really nice and tidy. And once I've done the frame, what I like to do is just take one of these sanding sticks here that I like to use for my metal work. And I just rub over the top like that. And you can see instantly the change in the color of the metal there. And all that's doing is it's cleaning off the edges, just the little cusps that we get by filing. And it's also just roughening the surface of the brass up a little bit. And that's a really good thing. You can see those scratches now starting to happen there. Dirty metal, clean metal. It means, first of all, it's gonna be much easier to solder on. And secondly, it means that it's gonna take the paint a lot better. Brass doesn't really like being painted. We're gonna use a photo etch paint anyway as an undercoat for this, which will help to actually bite into the brass and give us a long lasting finish. But this just scratching up the surface just a little bit serves those two purposes, cleans it up and gives us a nice key for the paint to etch into and for it to be a nice long lasting and tough finish because we don't want anything to chip off once our locomotive's actually on the 
track and it's on our, on our layout. So we'll just finish off working on these little bits, just cleaning off those edges, and then once I've done that, we'll come back and we'll start looking at the clearances for all the holes, and we'll start bearings, and then we'll get the soldering line out, and we'll actually start assembling this chassis. Okay, so our frames are nicely cleaned up now. We just need to drill out one more hole here, so these are for the brake hanger, so we'll just do that. This is about 0.8mm drill bit, so we'll just get that done like so. Quite easy just to go through this. You can set up your pillar drill if you want, but really there's no point because it takes just a few seconds just to drill through with a nice sharp drill bit. Like so. And then what we need to do is just ease the holes to the bearings. These are where the bearings go in here. And this is one of the bearings supplied with the kit. And you can see I've done one already. What we want is for that to be basically a friction fit inside the hole. We don't want that to be loose inside there. And as you can see, as supplied, the bearings don't push through the hole. So what we need to do is grab one of our tools. And this is my tap wrench. I've just stuck in uh, this particular tool, which I've forgotten the name of at the moment, but I'll continue anyway, because I'll show you how it works. And all we need to do is just start easing that hole. It's, it's called a cutting brooch, that's what it's called. And we're just easing that hole like so. Just like that with the cutting brooch. There we go, I'll show you that a bit nicely. And just ease through that ever so slightly. Just go a little bit at a time. And just check against the bearing. See if it fits. Not quite. You keep on easing the hole with the cutting brooch. You want to use a cutting brooch like this because it means that the hole stays round. If you use a file, for example, you're going to make it an oval and you're going to file inaccuracy into the chassis. So that's almost there, actually. Just need to keep going with that. Tiny bit more. So you don't want to go over the top of this, you don't want to go in with it too much. Otherwise it will be all loose and you'll have problems with aligning the chassis. There we go, perfect. And now because there's a slight cusp on there we just need to remove that with a file. There's going to be a little edge just on the edge of the bearing there so just remove that like that on both sides. Like so, and then just check with the bearing. That's still a nice tight fit in there. That's exactly what we want. So we just need to do the final hole on there, and that's all done. Now you will notice the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that I've removed the spring detail, and the reason for that is because first of all, uh, it makes things a lot easier actually when we're assembling the chassis. I'll just show you with the wheel in place there. Can't actually see any of that detail through there, and what it's going to do is it's going to make our pickups a lot easier to fit at the back there because we've got a lot more space to work with. Also marked off on the top of the frames there a bit that I'm going to remove and I'll talk about that in a moment. I'll finish this up and then I'll mock the chassis up and then we'll test for clearances. Okay so we just rigged up the chassis and the frames and I just want to show you this little bit because it's not really um, implied in the instructions so much but we do need to check at this point for clearances on the bottom of the model. So if you can see there the frame is just mocked up Hopefully that's picking up quite nicely. And what we can see is that the center axle here aligns quite nicely with the recess up, if I just take off that bit there, up in there like so. So it's actually quite a nice fit. And this is why I always build the gearbox first. It means that we can check the clearance, see that that will fit in there quite nicely actually, once we just remove this little bit of excess material around the frame. I'll just show you that. There we are. And then also that the motor and gear, the motor and the flywheel itself will also fit quite nicely inside the mode, inside the boiler housing, and that there's plenty of space. So that's a nice thing to do. And also at this time as well, we can just check as well the clearance for the frames of the actual gearbox assembly itself, and you can see that that fits in very nicely indeed there, like so. So just checking those clearances there. It's not really implied in the instructions. I suppose it's because they're using the GGH motor mount etc so just check at this point all the clearances and hopefully then we won't have too many problems going forward with the actual building of the model. So now we're going to solder on our bearings. I've got the soldering iron set up we're on 340 degrees celsius I'm using 
149 degree solder and lots and lots and lots of flux and I'm going to use something to hold the metalwork down with as I solder. So plenty of solder on the iron and place the iron on the work. Now it's going to grab initially because it's just getting up to temperature and it's quite a lot of metal to heat up. These frames are quite chunky but you can start to see now there it comes. As the metal gets up to temperature the solder starts to flow and I'm just drawing this solder around the bearing nice and slowly with the iron all the way around and we're looking for that solder to flow through and now that's beautifully molten all around the area just keeping the iron on there remove the iron once you've made a good joint and let it cool down and you can see the change in colour just to let you know it's cooled down and then we'll move on to the last one and I'll turn the piece of work over and show you what hopefully is a really nice joint. So let's turn that around. So there we go, in again. With the flux, lots and lots of flux. This is from Holly Hobby Holidays, excuse me, if I can speak properly. Plenty of solder on the iron. Let it grab, it's gonna grab, so just be patient, let it heat up. There it is. And we're just moving the solder around. I'm using plenty of solder. It's going to fill in all the gaps very nicely. Nice and molten, and it's flowing right through. Key is not to rush it. Let the soldering iron do the work. Remove the iron. Let it cool. It's still molten at the moment. I can see, there you go, it's just going off now. Great, and if I can dare to touch it and flip it over. Right, there we go. You can see that all that solder there has come through beautifully all around there. Those bearings are going absolutely nowhere. That's fully soldered, fully secure, and it's gonna be a really nice basis for our chassis. Bosh, all of these bearings are on nicely now, and we're almost ready for frame assembly. I'm just gonna ease these bearing holes just ever so slightly with a 1 8 inch tapered reamer, like so just to make sure that they're, and we're literally just taking off any slight burring here, nothing too significant. Again, this is the right tool for the right job, it just helps to have the correct stuff. But just easing all of those holes just a couple of turns like so. So here's the jig we're using, it's from Poppy's Wood Tech. It's a very simple, straightforward jig, I think it costs around 25 pounds and it's really useful in helping to assist us align our chassis properly. So the way that it works, quite simply, is that you just pass these 1 8 inch rods through the bearing holes like so. And this allows you, this is a large size one, so this allows you to build any size logo up to four coupled, probably even five actually, if, you, if you're doing a 9F or something like that. We just pass those through like so. You'll notice that I've already got the spaces on there like that. And then the other side as well. And it just basically means that you've got every chance of getting a really nice working chassis. So the principle is, as you can see hopefully now, the centre one is fixed. So that centre one is fixed. These front and rear ones can move left and right depending on your locomotive type. And then we need to just secure this jig or these bars on here like so with these little blue grippers. One, two, three. Good, all right, that's on there now. So we can, we want this to, we want there to be a little bit of movement on there. Move that in like so. There we are. Whoops. Just a little bit tight at the moment. I think that's probably because we've not quite eased the bearing holes enough, so those bearings are just a little bit tight in there. But basically everything is in the correct position where it should be. 
Now we can check with the connecting rods. Actually find that these are hopefully in the right position. And you can see that they are. And obviously because everything is concentric, That means that because the connecting rods are aligned and they fit on perfectly, then when the wheels turn around, everything else is going to be aligned fully as well. So everything here is set up nicely on the frames. Everything's nice and parallel. I've already soldered the first three joints. We've just got one more to do on these frames. And then the jig's work is basically done. So in with some flux there like so. Iron's still on 340. Pinch that just a little bit, in fact that should be okay, and then in with the iron and just let that solder flow right the way through like that. The solder's flowing, the iron's doing the work. Let that solidify and all our frames are still parallel and move nicely. Now the litmus test will be, now when we take off the frame from the jig, like so, and then I can just secure finally the couple of screw holes here as well. And now for the moment of truth, do the axles spin freely within each one? And you can see that yes, They do. Okay, we're now ready to do our first little bit of testing. You'll notice that I've secured already the Romford crank pins onto the wheels there with just a little bit of liquid thread lock. It just helps to secure these in. We don't want them coming off at some point in the future of the locomotive. And it does mean that if we need to, we can remove them if needs be. So all the wheels are on the axles now and you can see that they are spinning really nice and freely so we've got no problem there and we've quartered the wheels as well and what that means is basically the lead of the rods on the actual wheels themselves so for example if on the left hand side the crank pin is facing up then on the right hand side the crank pin will be 90 degrees forward of that that's called right hand lead most engines had right hand lead i believe however you need to check your prototype notes for that but to be honest with you it doesn't really matter does it as long as you've got some lead because I can't see the same side of the locomotive or both sides of the locomotive at the same time. It's physically impossible. So just get your lead right is what I'm saying once that's quartered. Now we just need to test with the rods on themselves. So let's put those on now. I've just with a little cutting brooch just widen the holes just a tiny little bit and that should just help just ease any problems that we might have with this. So there we are, the rods are now on and we can see by testing this that it's beautifully smooth. There are no tight spots anywhere. The wheels spin freely around like that and this testing process is ever so important because at any time if you've got any tight spots in there and the tight spots will be at the three o'clock or nine o'clock positions, they're most likely to be there. And if you do have that tight spot, all you need to do is just remove the rods like so, take it out and just get a very fine cutting brooch and just ease those holes ever so slightly. And I'm talking just a twitch. We're looking at probably a tenth of a millimeter each time you do that. So it's really, it's a nice cock basically of metal that you're gonna remove each time until you get everything smooth. But it's obviously imperative that before you do that, all the wheels rotate nice and smoothly and that the chassis fits perfectly level on the track. And I hope you agree that that is looking very nice indeed. So now I've taken this on a step further still and I've engaged the gearbox onto the driven axle. I've applied some power and we can test that the gearbox runs very, very smoothly in both directions. Testament, I think, to a really nice design of gearbox by Chris at High Level Kits. So that works really, really well. And then just on the track as well, up and down, like so. 
it works. And now I'll engage the rods as well and we'll check that the whole assembly works perfectly. And now you can see that everything is fully engaged and working really beautifully indeed. It's going to have a really high top speed. There's no binding, there's no tight spots, there's no nasty graunching noises or anything like that. This, bearing in mind, has had absolutely no oil on there whatsoever. No nothing, no running in. And already it's running absolutely beautifully. So there we go folks, I really hope you enjoyed that. That's the first stage of making the chassis complete. We've got now a rolling chassis. We've mechanised it as well with the motor and the gearbox there and we've tested everything. We're now well on the way to getting something that works really, really well and something that we can be really proud of. And I hope I've shown you with just a little bit of care, a little bit of attention, we can actually make something like this really, really well and, you know, not too difficult as well. It doesn't take that long, really, uh, as long as you have a logical sort of thought process about things, follow the instructions and a few basic tips and rules uh, along the way. That's it for this week, and next week we'll be continuing on, or sorry, next week, next time I do a video, rather, I should say, we'll be continuing on with this build. We'll probably get the rest of the chassis done, so we'll do things like the brake rods, all that sort of stuff, and then we'll probably move up to the body and see how we're going to fix the chassis to the body, all that sort of stuff. It'll all be covered in the Let's Build series, and we'll take everything step by step, and we'll show you how to build this model railway locomotive kit. So... Remember, press the like button. We're going to try and get double figures, I think, on this one. Quite a modest target. Get involved in the comments as well. Um, really does help with the YouTube channel. And also remember to have a look at Instagram too. So I shall see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.